know I'm loving it. Are you loving it? Yeah, you know you loving it. And if you're loving it, you can't get enough of it. Put a hand high, right where the other is. Sit a week, but can't find a quitter with me. It's that bit of sweet literature, that little streets. Walk with the Prince of Peace. See what he's. Hey, this is Dr. K from my medical school. And today we're going to talk about heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. As you may know, heart failure is described as an impairment of the heart to fill or eject blood properly. Heart failure is split into two different groups. One is called reduced EF or reduced ejection fraction, otherwise known as systolic heart failure, versus preserved EF or ejection fraction, otherwise known as diastolic heart failure. The causes and treatments of these two different types of heart failure are vastly different, so it's important to understand that. So let's talk about reduced ejection fraction heart failure, or systolic heart failure. Reduced ejection fraction heart failure is a result of the heart being unable to eject the adequate amount of blood needed. The reason this develops is that the ventricle, the left ventricle of the heart, dilates. The dilation is due to what's called eccentric remodeling. Eccentric remodeling means that instead of cells being laid side by side, to increase the wall of the heart, they're laid from end to end. So it actually caused a lengthening of the wall of the heart, if you can kind of imagine that. So what it does is it creates a larger chamber, a, di a dilated chamber of the heart. This eccentric remodeling can do to many things. So hypertension, uh, valvular disorders can cause it, just because of pressure placed on the ventricle. As a result of the dilation, the wall muscle of the heart is weakened, thus creating a reduced ejection fraction or a decrease in the amount of blood ejected from the heart. Now the causes of reduced ejection fraction heart failure are split up into ischemic causes and non-ischemic causes. So any type of heart attack can cause reduced ejection heart failure. And then non-ischemic causes include hypertension, valvular disorders as well. So these are all things that can lead to reduced ejection fraction heart failure. Now preserved ejection fraction or diastolic heart failure is different. And here we have chamber hypertrophy, meaning the wall of the heart is getting thicker. This is due to concentric remodeling. Concentric remodeling is when the ventricular muscle cells are laid next to each other, thickening the wall of the heart, creating chamber hypertrophy. As a result, the actual volume of the chamber within that left ventricle decreases because there's increasing muscle mass or, mu or depth or thickness of that ventricle wall. A simple example is to think of the heart failure like a cup. In style heart failure, you're taking a cup and you're expanding the actual chamber or volume that can fill that cup, but you're thinning out the wall in doing so. In preserved or diastolic heart failure, what you're doing is you're thickening the wall, and by thickening the wall of that cup, you're decreasing the amount of volume that actually you filled into that cup. That's a simple way to kind of differentiate within, between the two heart failures. The causes of diastolic heart failure or preserved ejection fraction heart failure are similar to systolic heart failure. They include coronary artery disease slash ischemia, hypertension, valvular disorders such as aortic stenosis, but other things can cause diastolic heart failure, like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So keep that in mind when you're trying to differentiate between these two types of heart failure. Now, let's delve into more about diastolic heart failure, the symptoms and the features. So heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, or diastolic heart failure, has the clinical symptoms of regular heart failure. We'll see the patient short of breath, with pulmonary edema, with a two plus pitting edema in the lower legs, they'll have increased JVD when you lay them at 45 degrees. Um, they have all the signs of heart failure, including the pedojugular reflex. But the difference is that they'll maintain their left ventricular systolic function. Here, the impairment is in diastolic function, so they have diastolic dysfunction. We can measure this dysfunction by observing the amount of volume that fills the left ventricle as well as the pressures that result because of this filling. And that gives us an indication of whether there's heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Now the symptoms that we talked about are one would be dyspnea on exertion, two, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, so do patients wake up at night, short of breath, 
Orthopnea, do they use multiple pillows? Sometimes we call it the pillow test. Do they have lower extremity edema, elevated JVD, elevated BNP? Keep in mind, obese patients will have a lower BNP than would be consistent with their heart failure. And then finally, pulmonary edema would also be an indication or sign of heart failure. So how do we diagnose diastolic heart failure? So first, obtain a chest x-ray. In this chest x-ray, you can see bilaterally these fluffy infiltrates, indicating what's likely pulmonary edema. The pulmonary edema is a result of the heart not being able to push out as much volume as it should because of poor filling of the left ventricle. Two, obtain an EKG. The EKG will tell you, one, if there's left ventricular hypertrophy, which would be consistent with diastolic heart failure. Two, an echocardiogram will also be helpful. Both of these can indicate valvular abnormalities as well, if there's amyloidosis, as well as assessing the ejection fraction. Echocardiogram would be used to assess the ejection fraction, not the EKG. And finally, we can obtain the old tried and true test of the BNP. But again, keep in mind, BNP will be falsely low in patients who have obesity um, and thus it's really based on your clinical decision or clinical impression of whether someone's an, an active heart failure or having a heart failure exacerbation. So now let's talk about the treatment of diastolic or preserved ejection fraction heart failure. Number one is to control hypertension or high blood pressure. Number two is to control ventricular rate. The reason why is that patients with diastolic heart failure have a tendency to develop atrial fibrillation. The reason for this is that because of poor filling the left ventricle, that fluid backs up into the atrium, and the atrium actually causes to be dilated. With that dilation, you have an increase in arrhythmias, atrial arrhythmias, one of these being atrial fibrillation. Three is to decrease peripheral edema, and four is to manage any evidence of cardiac ischemia. In managing the hypertension in patients with preserved ejection fraction heart failure, we use the medication that best fits their clinical scenario. So for example, an ACE inhibitor like lisinopril, we'd use in diabetics because it would help also reduce the proteinuria. Two, an ARB we'd use in patients who have either had a cough because of an ACE inhibitor or also diabetic as well. And we want to manage the hypertension, but as well give, give them the renal protective effects of an ACE or an ARB as well. For diuretics, we use to reduce patients' peripheral edema. For beta blockers, if patients have an arrhythmia, such as atrial fibrillation, we use beta blockers as well as calcium channel blockers to decrease their rate. So as long as we keep them rate controlled, they'll have better output with that. Keep in mind this very important point that reduced ejection fraction heart failure treatment is vastly different than preserved ejection fraction heart failure treatment. Here we talked about managing hypertension, atrial fibrillation, as well as edema. In reduced ejection fraction heart failure treatment, we have specific regimens that have been shown to improve survival, such as the use of beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, spironolactone, hydralazine and nitrates. Those have been shown to improve survival in patients with reduced ejection fraction heart failure. But in preserved ejection fraction heart failure, we tailor the treatment to specific patient scenarios, such as if they're diabetic, what other comorbidities do they have, do they have AFib, so on and so forth. So understand that difference, because it is vital in the treatment of reduced ejection fraction heart failure versus preserved ejection fraction heart failure. Another important point is that you have to be very careful with the use of diuretics in preserved ejection fraction heart failure. And the reason why is that these patients are preload dependent, meaning their ventricle is not filling enough already. So if you reduce the amount of volume that enters by giving them a diuretic, you can drop their pressures very drastically and very quickly. So let's kind of talk about that. So if we take a patient who has left ventricular dysfunction, meaning they have diastolic heart failure and poor filling, their heart rate will automatically increase to compensate for the low volume that they're putting out due to the poor filling. Now, because of this, they're preload dependent, meaning that they depend on the amount of volume they get into that ventricle. 
So if you give them a diuretic and you decrease the, their total volume of their body, you're going to decrease the, vi the vascular volume and thus you're going to decrease the amount of volume that's entering the ventricle. And thus they have less to put out and they develop hypotension. So it's very important to be very careful with diuretics in patients with preserved ejection fraction heart failure. Now this is a brief review of preserved ejection fraction heart failure, otherwise known as diastolic heart failure. If you like this video, give this a like. Make sure to share this video with your friends on both Facebook as well as Twitter. And make sure to place some comments down below about suggestions for future videos or questions that you have. Most importantly, subscribe. This is Dr. K from Medical School, and I'll see you next time.